So I thought today we would look at the topic of optimization. It's one thing that's been around in computer science for years, and I'm not talking about the mathematical optimization that um, people do, but I'm talking about making your code optimal. That might sound like I've defined optimization in terms of itself, and actually there's, there's a point there. And so the OED says optimization is the action or process of making the best of something, also the action or process of rendering optimal the state or condition of being optimal. And that is really what we're going to be talking about today, is how can we make our computer programs when we write programs the best computer program? But there's a question we have to ask first. What are we trying to optimize for? What are we trying to make it the best of? Do we want it to be as fast as possible or do we want to make it use the minimal amount of memory, in which case we're optimizing for memory size? Or these days we might even want to consider are we optimizing for power usage? If we're running on something like a mobile phone or a battery powered laptop, we may want to write our software so it uses as little power as possible at the expense of speed or memory usage. When we optimize something we're going to have to choose whether we're more interested in the speed that it takes to execute or whether we're more interested in the amount of memory usage or the power usage. So how do we go about optimizing our software? Well, the first thing to say is that we don't. No, nope, that's simple, end of video, we don't. I may be joking there, but probably the most helpful statement ever said about optimization was Don Knuth in a paper many years ago when he said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And actually, I think that makes a really good point. There's no point optimizing a bit of code if it's not going to give us a benefit when the program runs overall. So really, we don't want to optimize our program at all. We just want to sit and write our program and get a version that works, not worrying about the optimization. That's the first thing you want to do when writing software, writing optimized software. Just get a version that works because then you can use tools to sort of instrument that and actually find out, well, which bits are being slow? Where does the program spend most of its time? Can I ask a question? Yep. Is it not better to sort of design it properly in the first place and specify it? Um... <laughs> I mean, we're taking that as read that actually you'll have designed the software. And even if you are, again, the same thing, when you come to actually implement it, you don't want to try and implement an optimized version straight away. Um, whatever your design is, you would take that, implement it, and then see which bits need optimizing. We can spend ages optimizing a bit of code because we think it's an interesting problem to try and optimize it and we can produce a really nice solution only to find that that piece of code is called once at the start of the program and so we've managed to shave off um, a tenth of a second off a piece of code that's called once, probably while the person who was running the software had gone to make a cup of coffee so they never noticed all that work you'd put in. So we write the program first and then we see whether it's taking too long to execute or it uses too much memory for the environment we want to run it in or it's using too much power. We can use other tools, um, profilers, various other tools that are available to run the program, test what's happening as it's running, see which parts of the program are using the most time or using the most memory and then we focus our attention in terms of optimizing them looking at those parts of the program. So we don't go into this blindly and just think, right, let's have some fun. Let's go in and optimize this program. This function looks interesting. Let's rewrite that. We find out which parts of our program are what we call the hotspots, and we start looking at those to try and optimize them. So first of all, don't even bother thinking about the optimum way to implement it. Just get the program working and get something that you can test and you know that the program does what you want to do. Then test it to see which parts of it are need optimizing. A lot of computer programs are, are compiled and the compiler does some optimization for you. So is it something you need to do, optimizing code? So that's a, that's a really good, great question. Yes and no. So, I mean, these days, I mean, if you'd gone back 40 years, compilers were terrible. If you take it written a program in C and compiled it, the chances are that the code that it would produce would not be as good, particularly on a PC or a home computer at the time, as a good programmer could have written in raw assembler. And so people would go and rewrite it in assembler or optimize it because they could get better code that way. These days, the technology of compilers has moved on a lot. They all have an optimizing step that you can enable when you're compiling your code. In GCC, for example, you put the minus O, minus capital O flag with various parameters to specify what type of optimization you want there. And it will take your code and produce assembly code or machine code that is as optimal as the compiler can produce it. And that's great, and again, you should do that before you try and optimize it yourself. But you can often find that actually, there are situations where if you think about what the program's doing, 
you can probably come up with a better solution than even the optimizing compiler can, but you need to know where, where that's worth doing. And that involves knowing what it is your code needs to do. So for example, if you've got a program which takes three days to execute and you can shave a nanosecond off every iteration of a loop it's doing, that may well not make that much of a difference. On the other hand, if you're writing a, a game and you've got your screen being redrawn at 120, 144 frames per second, shaving a couple of nanoseconds off each iteration of a loop drawing the graphics on screen or something actually may benefit because it might mean you can draw one, it in one frame rather than it taking two frames to draw things on the screen. So again, you want to know what are the requirements of the program and how is it being used before you start making optimizations. And I'm tending to talk more about speed here but the same is true as if you're optimizing for power or if you're optimi optimizing for um, memory usage as well. You've got to make the same decision. We'll concentrate on optimizing for speed because that's what people have tended to do in the past. The best way to optimize your program is to make sure it's using the right algorithm. Um, you can use some sort of tips and tricks and techniques that you can find in books like Michael A. Brush's The Zen of Code Optimization, looking at how you could optimize programs to run on the 386, 486 and the Pentium, which shows how old it is. Are the uh, principles still the same though? So the principles are the same, or the sort of things to look at, but obviously um, the CPUs have all changed. And that's, when it comes to optimizing for speed, that's one of the issues. What may make your program run faster on one CPU isn't necessarily the same thing for another CPU. Today, we'll concentrate on the other side of optimization, what people tend to think of more as optimization, which tends to be the sort of tricks you'll find talked of in books like that, in web pages talking about how to optimize things, which is just looking at, you've written code, can you write it in a way that runs faster by just changing the instructions a bit and doing the same sort of thing, but making a few changes to that. And to do that, I'm gonna write a very simple program which copies a block of memory. So it's gonna take in a pointer to some memory, avoid star, and we'll say that's the destination. And we're going to take in a pointer to the source. And we're going to take in the number of bytes to copy. And the way that we could write this is we could set up a, a pointer internally to a byte. We don't know what it is, so we'll just keep call it unsigned. It doesn't really matter for this. And I'm not going to put the cast in just because it'll annoy people on YouTube. But we can assume that that's put in. I'm writing pseudocode. Here, we'll set up another pointer to point to the source, and then we'll set up a counter i, which we'll set to equal zero. And we'll say while i is less than n, don't need that there, we're going to set p plus plus to equal q plus plus, make that a pointer, otherwise it won't work properly, and then we will increment i. So that's a very, very simple memory copy program. We copy one byte from the source, which is what the star Q is in, that's a read a byte from the source, increment Q, and we'll write it to the destination and increment P. So we then move on to point to the next byte. And we just go around that loop until we've copied N bytes from there. So that reads the byte there, and this one writes a byte. Do you, are you writing before you're reading there, or am I jumping the gun? Uh, no, so the, the, this code's fine, it'll read it, because we've got the equals here, it'll know that it's got to evaluate the thing on the right before we can read it. And we're, and we're incrementing P and Q there. So let's have a look at this program and see if there's a way we could use some of the sort of tricks that people have tended to think about when they refer to optimizing things that we could apply to this. Let's move away from C and look at this in sort of a machine code representation. And we'll see what's actually happening here. I'm gonna use ARM because it's sort of relatively straightforward. So we'll say R0 contains the destination. And we can say R1, these are just registers, these just have the values in. We could say we move into R2, 0. We're then going to load a byte into R3 from the address in R0. We'll add one, sorry, in R1 there. We'll add one to R1 to move on to the next byte. So we're doing exactly the same, but we're sort of seeing the steps that are involved in a bit more detail. And well then we'll store the byte in R3 into R0 and we'll add one to R0, like so. This is what effectively the C compiler would generate for this if you were to write it out. And then we would have a compare instruction here that compares R2 with R3. 
That should have been R4 there. There we are, it's much easier writing this on the computer. We also need to add R2 with one here to count that. We'll compare them and we'll say while it is less than, we will loop around. So we'll go back around to loop, which we will label here. So now we can see the individual things that are happening. We're loading a byte from memory from the address R1. We're incrementing R1, we're adding one to it. We're storing it in the address in R0. We're incrementing that. We're incrementing the number we've counted and we're comparing them. And each time around we go the loop, we'll go around this loop, however many bytes we've got there. Let's see how many instructions it's gonna to take to copy one byte. So that's basically the bit in the loop. We'll ignore the setup cost here because that's gonna happen once. It's gonna be a negligible cost unless we're actually only copying zero bytes, in which case it'll take time. We should probably also have a branch to the condition here, just so that we actually can cope with the case when it's zero. So how many instructions we will copy per byte? Well, basically it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instructions. So our basic implementation is gonna take seven instructions per byte. So can we speed this up? By speeding it up, we want to take less instructions per byte. Well, okay, there's some very simple things we can do. We can get rid of two instructions straight away. So we can get rid of that instruction because the ARM CPU provides us with a instruction that will automatically add one to the value of R1. So we can get that for free. If we know what our CPU provides us, and this is something that the compiler would do to optimize the code. We're not doing anything yet that the compiler wouldn't do behind the scenes anyway. It would spot that and take it away. We can do exactly the same thing here. We can take that instruction there away. And we're now only doing five instructions per byte. So just by knowing our CPU a bit better, we can remove two instructions and that saves whatever percentage that is. It's what? It's five over seven? More than a quarter. More than a quarter. So that's 25% faster already just by knowing our CPU a bit better. And of course, this is something the compiler would do. But we're still taking five instructions to copy one byte. Can we improve on that at all? Well, let's think about what we're actually doing. We are copying one byte at a time. But could we copy more than one byte at a time? Well, the ARM CPU, along with most CPUs, is quite capable of copying a single byte from memory or copying four bytes from memory. Let's think about it in terms of an analogy. If you have a pile of books that you have to take from one side of the room to the other, if you carry one book at a time, it'll take you longer than if you carry four books at a time. Exactly the same thing here. If we copy more information each time, then we'll have to take less time to do it. So let's see how we could do that. So we've got the same thing. R0 points to the destination, R1 points to the source, R2 is our counter, and then R3 is the number of bytes to copy. So the first thing we need to do differently this time is that we've still got the number of bytes to copy, but we're now gonna be copying four bytes at a time. So we need to divide R3 by four. So we can do that either by writing a divide routine, but because it's a power of two, we could do that very quickly by just shifting it two places to the right in binary, which will divide it by four. So we can do that on the ARM CPU like so. And I'm gonna use a different register here, ASR by two. So this is divide by four. Now, why do we need to divide by four? So we only need to do a quarter of the number of iterations around the loop because each time we're copying four bytes in each time. So we need to divide it by four, except there's a problem. We're doing integer division. What's seven divided by four? Oh, okay, yeah, so we're gonna have a problem with odd numbers. So we're gonna have a problem with odd numbers or numbers which aren't a multiple of four. So we can test whether the number is wholly divisible by four, and if it is, well, we can just copy it using this method. If it isn't, we can copy it using this method and then copy the remaining one, two, or three bytes that we need to to finish off copying it. Now that's fine um, as long as we're not copying one, two, or three bytes because then we've got all the overhead of testing for it. So that's, again, something you perhaps want to know about your program. If you're copying lots of small bits, you probably don't want to use this optimized routine because it would actually end up being slower. Again, you need to know about how your program works to optimize it to make it run more efficiently. And then we set up R4 like that. Then what do we do? Well, we set up R2 again as before, comma zero, we set it to be zero, jump to our condition. We're gonna have our loop again. So we're gonna load in, this time we're gonna load in 32 bits. So we haven't got the B there for byte. We're gonna put that into R5. Then we're going to take that from R1. This time though, we're going to add on four. 
at the end because we've copied four bytes and so we want to step on to the next four bytes. Likewise, we're then going to store that back, no B again, into the address at R0 because we want to copy four bytes each time so we add on four. The rest of the code is the same. We compare R2 with R4 this time because that contains the division by four. If it's less than, we jump back to loop and this is where our conditional is there. So this time we still take one, two, three, hang on, why do we have four before? And I've missed out the add instruction. There we are, add R2, comma R2, comma hash one. So this time we've still got five instructions, one, two, three, four, five, but we will execute them, five instructions now per four bytes rather than per byte. So this time we'll execute these five instructions a quarter of the number of times that we had to here. So here we're doing it five per byte, here we're doing it five per four bytes, plus the setup cost, we're ignoring the setup cost. So just making a simple change like that can make our program, it's only taking a quarter of the speed. And again, this is something that the compiler may well spot actually, modern compilers can sort of make these optimizations. Now that works well for something as simple as this, because actually we're using a sort of simple example, but actually we can take this further. We can use what's something that's called loop unrolling. And this is great if you know exactly how many times you want to copy something. So rather than just copying four bytes at a time, now in reality there are instructions that can copy more than four bytes at a time on most CPUs. We'll ignore them for now, the same approach can take. What we could do instead is have our loop look like this. Load into R5 from R1, the pointer there. So we load in four bytes and then we store those four bytes. Okay, there's no change there. But then what we do is we load in another four bytes and then we store another four bytes here. And we keep doing this to make our loop have more iterations in it, but they're explicitly unrolled. So the loop now here, we would copy eight bytes. And if we were to loop around there, we'd copy eight bytes, or we could say make it do 16 bytes or 32 bytes. And that would mean that the cost per 32 bytes would be lower because we wouldn't have to keep testing whether we come to the end of the loop or not, we could sort of gain a speed up then. So what we're trying to do is reduce the number of instructions we're executing per byte of memory that we're copied. So unrolling the loop can make things faster. Now the problems you get, interesting problems is that gets too big, it then doesn't fit into your CPU cache and so we'll start to slow your program down. Um, so finding out what size works well really is dependent on what CPU you're using and what you're doing. But the important thing is that don't do this until you actually know where you need to do it and there are places that you need to look at it. With this example, we just looked at one way that we could speed up by changing the code. There are other approaches that you can take to optimizing your program that do similar things or different things. So you can, by changing the way you store your data in a program, make your program run faster. It seems counterintuitive and we'll look at it in another video probably, but if you change the order in which your data is stored, um, then you can make it much quicker to access the uh, data for certain types of operations. And as I said, if you really want to get some speed increases, these sort of tips and tricks are good for things like a memory copy routine, which gets called a lot and a lot of different places and you want it to be as fast as possible. But they're probably not the tricks you want to spend your time on in your sort of everyday program, unless you really need the speed there. Um, for example, if you're writing a video decompression algorithm or something as part of a game, then perhaps, yes, you do want to do these sort of loop unrolling because it needs to be fast. It needs to get the data within a certain limited amount of time um, so that you can display each video frame on screen at the right time. So if you look at the code for FFmpeg, you will see these techniques being applied there to make it as fast as possible on whatever CPU it's running. But for most programs, finding the right algorithm will give you a far better benefit in terms of speed. Again, I'm optimizing everything to the hilt. Test, and so we'll run speed test back. So our binary search is working. Now what would have happened is someone implemented this based on some textbook, it works fine, they considered their job done for the day and they went home. Right?